communicating is hard. My name is Marcus Placona. I'm a developer evangelist for a company called Twilio. You can see my details here. Um, Marcus Placona on Twitter. So if you want to shout me some abuse later, feel free to do it. My email. And who, who knows about Twilio here? <laughs> Quite a few people. So for those who don't know about Twilio, Twilio is a communications API that helps your applications communicate with the people you care via SMS messages, voice, video, and IP messaging. But I'm not here to talk about Twilio today. I'm here to tell you a story. Once upon a time, um, it all started when I was a contractor. And I was a Java contractor. So I was working as a Java developer. And I was hired to work with uh, ColdFusion. So I was hired to make a ColdFusion application better. Now, before I carry on, let me just clarify something here. When I'm talking about ColdFusion, I'm really not talking about Fusion Reaction or anything like that. Uh, that's kind of cool, but that's not what we're going to be talking about. I'm really talking about Adobe ColdFusion and its amazing tags and everything about ColdFusion. Uh, the one thing about using something like ColdFusion, which is a language that runs on the JVM, is the fact that you have very little control about everything that it's doing because everything has been pre-implemented for you. Which, what happens is, because it runs on the JVM, you have control. So you can create your own Java classes and you can improve your performance. And this is why I was hired. I was hired to improve performance. Uh, does anyone know about ColdFusion here? Does, it, does anyone work with ColdFusion? You work with ColdFusion? Okay. We'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> um, so as a Java developer, I was hired to make a ColdFusion application work, and I was hired to make it better, right? Um, if I just said happily ever after, so everything works. Like, I managed to make it really better. I managed to improve performance and everything. The e-commerce, it was an e-commerce. It was going well. It was selling a lot. Uh, but this would have been the shortest presentation ever if I just said, yeah, we live happily ever after. No. In fact, what happens was, one day, my boss came to me and said, I've been thinking about migrating. I've been thinking about moving into .NET because we now have a sort of a Frankenstein monster here because we've got some Cofusion, we've got some Java, there's this mixture of classes, there's, there's quite a lot going on here. So my boss decided to migrate. Uh, I was up for the challenge because it was going to be it was going to be C sharp, and I was yeah that that can be interesting. However, what happened next? And I quote because this is not me saying this is my boss saying. My boss came to me and said, this was like the reasoning behind moving into .NET. My boss said, after analyzing both languages, I came to the conclusion that migration is almost like a copy and paste. Uh, <laughs> so let's just dissect this a little bit. He said, both Java and C Sharp languages are almost like a copy and paste. I mean, I knew this wasn't true. However, he went to Stack Overflow, and he looked at, he looked at some C Sharp codes, he looked at some Java codes, and he was like, yes, they're very similar. There's classes, and the code looks the same. But this is where it stops, right? The first thing that came to my mind was a phrase a very clever guy said once on Stack Overflow, which is this. Java is to JavaScript as car is to carpet. Other than the name, there's really no similarities there, OK? Um, I'm pretty sure Java and .NET are the same thing. There are no similarities, right? Other than there's some syntax, uh, well, there's some very similar syntax. The technologies themselves are completely different, OK? Now, being a contractor, like I said, I was getting paid by the hour. So I really didn't care, but I had my pride. And remember, we were moving from a monolith, we were moving from a massive application in something into something else that could turn out to be another massive application if we just started to build it. However, what we decided to do was we decided to use SOA. Okay? Uh, to clarify on the SOA, I'm not talking about Sons of Anarchy here. <laughs> Sons of Anarchy is awesome, but we're not going to talk about it today. I am talking about service-oriented architecture. 
uh, or microservices, as you will. Like back then, it was service-oriented architecture. Now it's microservices. We were going to build some small and elegant services, and the idea with them was if you can have services that do small things and they're very self-contained, it's really easy for you to just migrate parts of the system. So the idea here was, let's not do a massive migration. Let's migrate bit by bit. So let's just take some parts of the application. Uh, who's done microservices here? Cool. So what happens when you do microservices is you get to a communications problem. Uh, there are ways in which you can get your services to talk to each other. If they're all on the same language, it's probably fine. If they're not on the same language, then you come into a communications issue. I had developers coming to me and saying, I'm doing microservices and all I use is HCP. So they use HCP as their glue. I almost feel like saying, and how do you feel about that? Do you want to have a talk about it? Uh, are you feeling lonely because of this? So I feel like helping people with this, OK? In my case, I decided to use queues. I thought, OK, I have multiple languages right now. I had Java, I had .NET, and I decided to use queues to communicate between my applications, OK? The idea was I was going to get a message, I was going to put it on the queue, and then my other applications would just go and pick it up. So that's all good. Now, why queues? Um, the first thing here is everybody hates queues. Like, queues are terrible. I hate queuing for food. I hate queuing at the airport. Everyone hates queues. British people, however, they love queues. Uh, it wasn't very hard for me to convince my boss that queuing was the right solution. Because as soon as I said queuing, my boss was like, yes, let's just do it. I don't even care about it. I just want to queue. OK, uh, so convincing my boss of that was easy. But what really is a queue? Um, a queue is a, um, a set of semantically precise messages. So you basically, when you have a queue, you have some semantically precise messages. They, because they are semantically precise, they promote loosely coupled architecture. So they promote loosely coupled systems. Uh, and they have very minimum impact. So when I say minimum impact, I'm talking about if I have multiple systems talking via queues, I can very easily remove one of those systems or replace one of those systems. Because as long as my messages are semantically precise, everything is awesome. But let's go back to communications. Let's go back to 1957. This is how the world communicated back in 1957. If you wanted to call your neighbor, you would talk to one of those lovely people here, you would phone one of those lovely people here, and he would say, I want to talk to Bob. One of those lovely people here would just unplug a jack from one place and move it to another. And then you'd be talking to Bob. So they were responsible for how you could communicate. And if they got it wrong, you'd be talking to someone else. But how does communication actually work? This example, we have two cats. Okay, The first cat goes meow. The second cat replies with meow. That's really easy. They both speak the same language. That's really fine. You can do the same with dogs as well. So guess what? The first dog goes woof. The other dog just goes, oh, hi, and it's all good. OK, two dogs communicating. How do you do that with Java and .NET? Java goes email.send message. .NET goes, what? And bam, you see that. Do I have many Java developers here? Have any of you not seen this message before, or this zero before? Uh, yeah, it happens quite a lot. Um, but let's go back to this example, because we know dogs and cats can talk. Um, we have Java trying to go email.send message into .NET. Obviously, we know that doesn't work. Now, if I could get Java to send a semantically precise message into .NET, in this case, I've used JSON, then yes, that's going to work. Because Java speaks JSON, .NET speaks JSON, even Haskell speaks JSON. Um, so we know that's going to work. The one problem you have is 
If you want to get those two languages to communicate, unless you do it via HTTP, you need to use something else in the middle. You need to have a proxy in the middle. If you don't want to use HTTP, what you can have is a queue. The way it works with a queue is Java puts a message on the queue. .NET, just over there, is listening to this queue. As soon as a new message goes into this queue, .NET just picks it up. And now, the world is talking, OK? Um, how does that really work? So if you have a queue in the middle, how, uh, what's really happening? So in this example here, I have a publisher. And remember my 1957 picture, where I had the lovely people moving around jacks? That's my messaging bus. That's my analogy here. Uh, the publisher wants to do something. So the publisher wants to send some messages. The publisher wants to send an email, upload an image. The publisher wants to get some currency conversions. The publisher sends those messages into a queue. I have three new characters here. I have Mrs. Banker, I have the doctor, and I have Mr. Postman. Mrs. Banker is actually very good with numbers. So Mrs. Banker, as a subscriber, gets anything to do with numbers here. Uh, Mr. Postman is very good with sending messages. So Mr. Postman get, gets anything to do with messages. And the doctor is very good with being the doctor and doctoring images. Uh, and the doctor gets all of the images, all of the messages about images. The messaging bus is what's coordinating everything. The messaging bus has control over all your queues. Uh, once you've done that, everything is great. Happy days, okay? So that's like, that's queuing 101. Everything is working, you've got your applications communicating. However, what most people forget about queuing is you get some extra stuff. That's not all, you get some extra stuff. Um, the extra stuff you get is you get, well, you get traffic shaping because now you have a queue in the middle so you can control your applications and you can say, hey, if I have really high traffic, I want my applications to spin up new instances of it. So if you have a lot of traffic on your application, you can actually spin up new instances. I know it's fascinating. I, I, I can't stop looking at it. Yeah. Um, the other thing you get is you get scalability. Uh, it goes together with what I just said. Now that you have applications communicating via queues, you can have multiple instances of your application. You can have multiple versions of your application, which helps you scaling. Like we're thinking at scale here, we got scalability out of the box by just using queues. Uh, the other thing you get is you get isolation. Okay. Uh, we all know that we should keep errors away from the applications. We all know that our users don't want to see errors. Our users, they want to see that everything works. If you have one single application, you have no isolation. Right now, whenever something happens, your user will know. And it only takes one bad experience for users to say, you know what, I'm not using these websites anymore. And the application in question here was an e-commerce. Okay? So, if you mess up with the users from an e-commerce, it's very easy for them to just move away. There's loads of other options. So keeping your errors away is great. You get cross-platform as well. Um, now, because you're not using the same language, you can use the best tool for the job. So if you want to use some Node.js, you want to use some Java, you want to use some .NET, you can do it now. Okay? Um, I've had some cases where I was building microservices and I thought Node.js would be the best tool for the job because it was a small service, and I thought, well, this solves my problem. Um, but now, you're not just limited to this one technology. You can use whatever you want to use. And because you're using microservices, if it turns out your service is not very good and you need to replace it, because you have queues in the middle, it's really easy to replace as long as your services can talk the same language. So going back to these semantically precise messages there. This is no silver bullet, okay? And I really feel like I need to say this. Queuing is no silver bullet. It doesn't solve all your problems. And that's where I made a mistake. My mistake was thinking that, wow, queues are so awesome. I'm going to use it for everything. When you're talking about operations that need to be synchronous, Queues aren't great. 
if a user is expecting some feedback, queues really aren't the best thing for you. Okay? If you're doing asynchronous things, if you're doing things that don't, don't need to return anything, like if you're sending emails, for example, that's absolutely great. Um, I decided to process payments with this because I thought, well, that's going to be okay. Like we get, you know, we get quite a few thousand um, orders on the website. But the queues can handle this because it's pretty quick. But I was relying on the banks to process payments, and I have no control of banks. So basically, what what started to happen on the system was when we had very few customers purchasing things, everything was okay. When we had loads of customers, um, it was almost like me saying, hey, I'm going to process your order, but I've got a queue with 11,000 orders, so just, just hang tight. I, I, I'll get back to you on it. And I basically made my users wait. Okay? And I made my users wait more than they had to wait, because waiting for a bank to process a payment is always excruciating enough. Waiting for 11,000 transactions to process a payment is terrible. So at this point, we started to get calls in customer service saying, hey, um, I've been waiting for about two minutes now, or my session just expired. What do I do now? And that's when you don't know what to do, because has that payment been processed? The user doesn't have an email. The user doesn't have a confirmation ID. So I can't even look up. All I can do is I can look up for a, uh, an e for their email and see if I can see an order, but I can't see if the, process, if the payments has been processed. So that's not a very good idea, okay? Uh, anything that relies on feedback, queues aren't great for it. Uh, if you're doing asynchronous process, that's really great. Um, but cool, I talked about queues. Now, I want to talk about options. There are some options for queuing. Uh, the first one I looked at was Microsoft MQ. So remember, I was moving into a Microsoft, I was moving into .NET. So the first thing I looked at was, well, Microsoft MQ comes with .NET out of the box. I have .NET, I have Microsoft MQ. So that's a good option, right? It's a good option if all you're doing is Microsoft. Microsoft MQ can't talk to any other systems. So if you have a Java system, Microsoft MQ won't be able to talk to it. So that doesn't really work for me. RNMQ is great if you want to have a hosted solution, but this is an off-site hosted solution, which basically means to get to it, you will need to make an HTTP request. If you're making an HTTP request, you're just denying the whole point of you know, not making HTTP requests. Uh, Redis, uh, it, I think if some of you saw Mike Elsmore's talk yesterday, uh, he mentioned, uh, he, ma he was talking about some queuing systems, and he mentioned Redis. Um, that's the lazy solution, okay? It's totally going to work, no big deal, but that's the lazy solution. Redis is not built for queuing. Redis is not, is not meant to be, use, to be used for queuing. Uh, the same thing for Kafka. Kafka's not, really not meant to be used for queuing. Kafka's meant to be used for piping. I know you're going to be talking about this later. Uh, I've seen, there's been scenarios where, well, actually I was talking to Mike about this yesterday. There's been scenarios where you can use Kafka on top of queuing so you can pipe all of your requests into queues. Yeah, so that's, that's a really cool usage. Now, there's people using Kafka just for queuing. Is it wrong to do that? No. Is it the best thing you can get out of queuing? No. JMS, Java Message Service, we go back to the same Microsoft MQ issue, if you only have JVM applications, you can use JMS. If you have JVM applications with .NET applications or any other technology application out of the JVM, JMS is not the best option. RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ is an open source project. Uh, it's got an amazing support. They have uh, its free support. They have an enterprise support as well. So if you have a company and you want to pay for support, you have 24-7 support, you can get that. Uh, it's built in Erlang, so it's built for performance, and it works wonderfully. I, I love uh, RabbitMQ. It's, it's what I went with when I was moving into, um, into queues. However, I've talked about all the options and everything. So I want to do a demo. I'm going to try and do a demo. But in this demo, I'm going to ask for your help. Uh, the way you'll be able to help me, if that's okay with you, 
I'm going to ask you to send me an SMS message. So I'll give you a number, and I'll ask you to send me an SMS message. That's all you need to do. You promise not to be rude on your SMS messages, and I promise not to spam you back. Deal? So I'm going to come off my slides and change my mirroring. And what I've got is I've got RabbitMQ running locally here. As you can see, there's nothing on my queue, so my queues are empty. This is the admin for RabbitMQ as well. It's not a great admin, it's not a great dashboard, but RabbitMQ has uh, an API. So if you want to build your own dashboard, you can do it. And I have two applications here. I have a writing application, which is a Java application. This is a Spark application with two endpoints. It's got a um, slash endpoint, which, well, you can, let me see if I can make this a bit bigger. Yeah. So it's got a slash endpoint, which is, which is just saying hello world, and it's got a say hello endpoint. So say hello is the important bit here. Uh, what say hello does is it creates a new connection factory with my RabbitMQ instance via localhost. Uh, it creates a connection to it, and it declares a channel. When it declares a channel, it declares a queue name. And if you go back to here, you'll see my queue is called messages. Okay? On my code, I'm declaring my queue name as messages as well. Then it creates a JSON packet with the information that comes into my application. So I have a from, I have a to, I have a body. And it turns that into JSON and publishes into RabbitMQ. Now, what I would like you to do is, this application is running, so if you want to check that the application is running, I'll just go run my Hello World here. I know it's running, it's running localhost. And what I would like you to do is, I would like you to send me a text message to this number here. So that's a local, that is a local number. Uh, and if you send me a text message, we'll see that something will change on the management page. So I'm going to go and send one as well. So I've sent my message. Let me know when you're done. Yeah? Now, with some luck, when I go back here, I should see that I have some messages. So I've got eight messages on my queue now. So seven of you, because I, I sent a message. So seven of you uh, sent me a message. The number is still over there on the search box. So if you've not got the number and you want to try it, you'll see that this keeps on growing. Now, the cool thing about this is if I try and get those messages, if I want to see what the messages look like, I'm going to go for the first one. Uh, I can actually see what it looks like. Ah, oh, that's adorable. Uh, so I can actually see what it looks like. So this is just a JSON message, okay? So there's not much happening there. Um, my Java application took an SMS message, published on the queue, and that's it. So there's not really much happening there. Now remember, I was migrating from Java into .NET. So to illustrate this, I built a .NET application as well, which I'm going to show you now. Do I have any .NET developers here? Woo! Nice. Uh, this is .NET on a Mac, so this is the open source .NET stuff. If you look at my code, you see I'm basically doing the same. Let me try and just make this a little bit bigger. Let's go with 18. Yeah, that's that's better. Um, if you look at my code, you see I'm doing pretty much the same thing here. So I am creating a new factory. I am just instantiating a Twilio REST client because I want to be able to reply to this message. I'm declaring my queue. So that's the same queue name, right? Messages. And I'm creating a, um, I'm creating a consumer. So I'm now going to be listening to those messages. So the idea with this application is I want to be able to listen to those messages. And for every single message I get, or every single message on my queue, 
I just want to go and display them on my terminal. So going into terminal, I am going to run my application. And hopefully, it's all going to be good. Yeah, so as you see, I'm starting to receive all the messages. I'm starting to get all the messages I had on my queue, right? Oh, giggity. <laughs> um, I'll go back to my queue, and you should see that the messages are disappearing as the messages appear here. And now, at some point, I have no more messages. I've received all of my messages here, and you should start getting a message back. You should start getting a reply from my application. Now, imagine if, <laughs> imagine if this was at scale. Imagine if I wanted to send a thousand messages, a million messages. Only one system wouldn't be able to handle it. If I had multiple instances of this application running, I'd be able to handle it. Maybe one system would be able to handle a million messages, but it would take some time. If I had two systems, it would take half the time. If I had four systems, and, and you know that's how it goes. So what you get is you're now taking away all the burden of you having to control your application, or you having to control how I, I can't stop looking at this. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna minimize this because I know it's gonna go wrong in a second. Um, now you have control of how your application grows. You have control of how your application scales. Okay. Uh, let me go back to my slides. So um, we have about 10 minutes. Um, but I want to talk about what we've just discussed here. So what are the takeaways? So the first one is communication is hard. Um, I started with this sentence because, remember, this is like an Estonian conference and I'm here speaking English. Okay? Uh, communicating is hard, right? There's ways you can communicate and everyone understands. But communicating is hard. There's no universal thing. There's no universal language. High traffic is a good problem to have. Okay? When you build your applications, if you think at scale, you are much less likely to fail. So thinking at scale is really important, unless you're building a small website. Uh, other than that, thinking at scale, it's really, really important. Stay away from exceptions. Isolate your applications as much as you can. Using queues, you are able to just isolate your application as much as you need. You can have multiple queues. You can have queues that talk to queues if you need. Don't overcomplicate it, but you can. If that's a need, you can do that. Use the best tool for the job. This is like, this is probably my most favorite thing about queuing. You are just able to use the best tool for the job, and you're able to experiment as well. You're able to use all the technologies. You're able to maybe fail. But if you fail, you're failing in a very small scale. It's not your entire application. Like You don't want to build a massive application and then find out that as soon as you have more than two users on it, it crashes. If you have small applications, and if you have those applications talking to each other, that's not going to be a problem. If your application crashes with more than two users, it's OK. You can fix it. Queues are the answer to everything. Uh, I learned this the hard way. I'm sure some people here have used queues. It's really exciting. It's, it's really cool to see that you're communicating. But I learned this the hard way. So the reason why I decided to give this talk is because I wanted to try and avoid that people would learn this the hard way. My name is Marcus Bacona, developer evangelist for Twilio. I'll be here at the conference. If you want to come and talk to me, feel free to talk to me. And we're totally hiring. Um, if you're from Estonia and you're looking for a job here, we are totally hiring. So uh, come and talk to me. Go to the website, send an email, do something, uh, send me an SMS. And thank you so much. Woo. We have we have about ten minutes. Yeah, we have ten minutes for questions. Uh, I'd love to take your questions. How do you handle like if your messages changes? 
like it's kind of uh, a change in your message, so it's kind of an application uh, API change. In this case, where you're using queue. So it's how do you handle to have like synchronize all your uh, nodes that are consuming those messages? Yeah, I had these. Um, so you can configure your queuing system to retry messages, and if you can't deal with those messages, you can say, put that aside, so you can store that on a log or something. I didn't know this, okay? Uh, and not knowing this, one day I got to the office, and I had two million messages on a queue. And I was like, how, how did that even happen? Why, why do I have two million messages on a queue? It turns out my queue got stuck. Uh, there's probably a better technical name for this, but my queue got stuck. Why? Because one of my messages actually changed. My systems couldn't handle this message. So what it would do is it would requeue every single time it couldn't handle my messages. So I had too many messages on all of my queues because my systems just couldn't handle it. Obviously, it's because I didn't know you could just move that message away. Uh, it was one instance of my application that couldn't handle it, and it would just like check that message back. But you're, like, you're talking about loads and loads of requests and that message going back and going back and going back. Um, the best, I would say, the best way for you, for you to handle this would be make sure that you have you know, a controlled number of retries. And if you retry up to like three times, for example, check that message out. And that will, that will sort of deal with it. So there is not a way kind of a message discovery thing that you know, oh yeah, this, uh, these messages all are uh, this structure and it's changed and this system not, oh, it changed for some reason. Maybe. You can you can build it in your system, but not on not on the queuing system. So the queuing system is meant to be very simple. It's meant to be like message goes in, message goes out. It doesn't have any logic. You do some configurations on this, like you can cluster, for example, so you can have multiple queuing systems, and they can all be clustered, which is really easy to do, by the way. Um, but there's not a lot of configuration on this. Like, you can't do a discovery, for example, on a, um, at least not on RibisMQ. If anyone uses a different queuing system and there's a way to do it, so I'd love to know, but you, not on RibisMQ. Any more questions? Yeah, regarding this question, like, can't you have producer and consumer speak the same protocol, for example? Yeah. Messaging protocol, for example, you're not gonna, if you use, um, let's say, user generated objects or classes, mm -hmm. you're gonna use other messages. And how you produce and consumer be aware of that? So, when you, when you use queuing systems, you are, you are using a different protocol already. So, you are using AMQP. Which is the protocol? So you you you, well, you I'm can't. About the messaging protocol, not exactly the communication, not the transfer protocol. But for example, if you have, um, you need to make sure the producer consumer um, know that there was a protocol change, message protocol change. For example, you have like message A, and producer consumer need to know that the message A changed. Yeah. So what I did, um, what I did on one of my systems was. It wasn't really a, a, it wasn't as complex as a discovery system, but what I did was my systems would, would notice that there's been a change in a message and try and adapt for it. Um, I, didn't, I didn't make it as complex as if my message dramatically changes, it would just adapt for it, but it would, it had some level, like some wiggling level on it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like, it's within your system, so you can. Like, you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, it's just that the queuing systems don't really cater for, for these kind of things. Because they're, they're meant to be simple. Like, it's, it's by design. They're meant to be simple, and you make them complex as you go. Any other questions? I'm not sure I got, I understood your question. Uh, contract testing uh, was uh, testing that uh, consumer and provider tested if they, if they send both the message with some format 
and the other end is uh, like this. Does it accept the same format? Yeah. So I had this. Um, I had this on my um, on my build system. Uh, so like we had unit tests that would check the um, that the contracts was met. Um, we even got to a point where we had developers building their own objects. So I'm talking about like playing like Pojos, like plain old, plain old Java objects or plain old CLR objects. Uh, we got to a point where instead of asking the developers to build those objects themselves to then be serialized into JSON, we gave them a, an interface where they could type in the JSON. So they would basically go and create the message and generate the serializing objects. So it's, it's almost like going the other way. So if I had a Java developer and a .NET developer working on the same system, on the same message, all they had to do was they went into this system and generated the objects they wanted. And then they just imported that into their project. Um, because now you're talking about generating code. And machines don't normally generate wrong code. Um, so as long as they were using that tool, so as long as they were coming from that tool, as opposed to building the objects themselves, you avoided things like uh, different like casing, for example, uh, different order, because the objects were all generated the same way. So we, we almost got to a point where, well, we actually got to this. All you had to do was you just create your JSON, and you put that on your project, and all your objects get generated. Which is, which is one way of mitigating this. Um, and obviously everything was documented, uh, every, everything was documented, all of the messages were documented as well, and all the developers had to do was try and make sure that whenever something changed, that got propagated into all of the different systems. Yeah? Uh, is there a hard limit for the message size, so that if I... Uh, my entire object, then you can see? Yeah, the answer is no. Uh, so th there's no hard limit. However, you want to try and make your messages as small as you can. Because when you're talking about having thousands of messages in a queue or millions of messages in a queue, all those messages are either stored in memory or stored in disk. Uh, obviously, if you create in massive messages, you are storing those things in disk. And if something was to happen and all of your applications were to die, all those messages would still be stored in disk. And then you start having, you know, like running out of space or something like that. Uh, so there's no hard limit. You can go as crazy as you want because you're storing like strings inside of it. But always try and make sure that your messages are small um, if you can. So I wouldn't store massive objects on it. Um, sometimes it makes more sense to have references to objects that are on the database, for example, where you can actually go and store massive objects and just have a reference to it. Mm -hmm. Because you're talking about queuing. Do you know what I mean? Time doesn't really matter too much here. You can have, you can have a message on a queue that has an ID, and you can have all the information about that message on the database. And if it takes one minute or five minutes to process this, it's normally fine. So that's one approach. Um, I, I would, my, so my, I would try and avoid uh, storing massive messages inside Rabbit, but there's nothing to say you can use like MongoDB to do that, for example, because MongoDB handles massive messages better than RabbitMQ. Uh, you partially mentioned it, but uh, uh, the synchronous, uh, I mean, uh, very often you cannot afford uh, asynchronous uh, uh, synchronicity in the higher level. Mm. So um, have you tried uh, using some kind of, uh, I don't know, remote processing protocol like JSON RTC or something, or, or, or you just all, uh, use it uh, for asynchronous, asynchronous messaging? Yeah, I've only, I've only ever used it for asynchronous uh, processes. Um, I like to think that synchronous processes, uh, you, you need to process them as fast as you can, because you've got people waiting for it. Um, RPC would help you with the synchronous process, 
But I think there's better ways of doing this than just using um, RPC. Any more? Uh, thinking about the queue, it's not like a single point of failure. Like, uh, how do you handle that if the uh, queue fails? Like, if you make a uh, chaos monk experiment with the queue, you can actually get the messages that, in the meantime, that you uh, uh, build up another queue and just have everything running. Yeah. So we had we had multiple queues, like multiple boxes with multiple installs of queues. Uh, they were all clustered. So basically, you would need to do something very wrong to break all of those boxes. And if you do that, then you've got bigger problems already. <laughs> um, but yes, the, the, all the queues were clustered. And the, the coolest thing about RabbitMQ is it handles the clustering for you. So you will never have the issue of two consumers actually trying to pick up the same message. Because as soon as one picks up the same message, it comes off the queue. But the queue is expecting an acknowledgment of processing. So it's almost like your system needs to go and say, hey, I've done this. Because if your system doesn't say this, the message goes back in the queue. Uh, so yeah, if one of your queues fail, you, you're still OK. If all of them fail, then you, <coughs> you're screwed. <laughs> OK, uh, one, last, one last question. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you can choose where you store your messages. You can store your messages on a, uh, on a DAS, for example. So you can store your messages in a different server. You can store your messages on disk on each of the servers, or you can store your messages in memory. And those messages will be available in every single one of your, of your Rabbit installs. Uh, the difference between uh, installing that in memory is if all of your services die, you lost it. Storing that in disk means if you were to stop all of your services, all of your queuing services, you've still got that on disk. And then if you have a disk failure, then you lost it. But um, you, you get what I mean. OK, we haven't got more time. Thank you very much.